stop seeing awkward, we can we can always go back to avatars. Welcome uh, to all our uh, all our listeners uh, who are tuning in for this interview. Um, we have a very special uh, very special show for everyone here today. Uh, joining us is our longtime contributor. Um, in fact, in fact, I, I want to say almost from the very beginning of uh, Real Crusades history, and uh, um, very dear friend uh, and best-selling author, uh, Dr. Helena Schrader. Um, just, to, just to get some things out of the way, uh, Dr. Schrader is joining us uh, all the way from her uh, beautiful retirement home in Kythera, uh, yes, in yeah. part of Greece. I hope I didn't butcher that pronunciation. Uh, so, uh, so she does. Uh, if, if she does, if we do end up having some technical difficulties, I know uh, there's some there's some connectivity issues with the the internet out there. So hopefully, hopefully we get through this and uh, uh, and we're able to continue this interview. Uh, that was on cue. I got away. Maybe I'll go to Avatar and see if that helps. <laughs> um, what, Dr. Dr. Schrader, while you set that up, um, I, I know we were going to uh, do some yeah, interviews. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to have some uh, or some introductions. So, uh, but just by way of introduction with yourself, um, you uh, had a very long uh, and um, distinguished career with the U.S. State Department. Um, yes. yes. And uh, I, I'll let you get into the details on that. But uh, um, and now you uh, and, well, and throughout your career, you've always maintained an interest in uh, the, the crusading era um, with uh, just the medieval history in general, uh, even to the point where uh, you've written several books. You, you are um, you've, you've been published multiple times uh, with both nonfiction and fiction and uh, I know your particular specialty, and this is what we're going to talk about with you today, is uh, the society and culture of the Crusader states of the Levant um, during the Crusading era. Uh, so, if you feel free to take the floor and uh, and 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 uh, fill in any any gaps I may have left. No, no gaps. I think you probably you um, you were very kind. You were very generous in your description. I'm I'm not a best-selling author. I have written. I've published a number of books, as you say, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, most of my nonfiction has actually been about World War II, um, the Berlin Airlift, women in aviation, because I actually did my dissertation on the German resistance to Hitler. So that was my um, where my actual original academic credentials were. The interest in the Crusader sites did come after I was actually beyond academia, I don't know if had my PhD already. And then I was, um, as you say, working and living abroad uh, in Europe. And it was actually even before I joined the State Department that I had a first, I went to Cyprus and, and encountered this amazing story about Richard the Lionheart uh, conquering Cyprus in six weeks with just two casualties and then setting up a kingdom that lasted 300 years, well, 200 years of the kingdom at least, but 300 years before it fell to the Ottomans. And that was just, it was just mind boggling because I had never thought of Richard the Lionheart being in Cyprus. I had never thought about there being a, a kingdom on Cyprus that was, you know, Latin Christian and part of the Crusader kingdom. So that's what actually sparked my interest in the Crusader states. And maybe that's why I was more interested in the Crusader states than in the Crusades from the very beginning, because it was that encounter with Cyprus, which of course is the most peaceful of the Crusader states. It um, is, it doesn't, of course, it doesn't get established until the third crusade rather than the first crusade. And much of its history was more involved in internal struggles. Of course, the famous struggle between Frederick II and the King of Cyprus and his barons um, in the mid 13th century. And then later, of course, it was struggles between the, the Crusaders, the Franks and the Genoese and the, and the Venetians. So it was not a very, it's not, a, it's not your typical Crusader state. But once you get into these things, I think that's probably true of all of us that are part of real crusades history. You probably start with one piece and then you start you know, learning more and more and it just um, you know, sucks you right in because there's so many fascinating stories and so many fascinating personalities. I'll stop there in case you have another question. <laughs> no, that's uh, that. It actually uh, pretty much just covered our our first real question for you, which was, uh, you know, what drew you to uh, the the crusading era and the, and the crusader states in particular. Um, I, you mentioned a, a very interesting 
facet about the, the that entire period of history that a lot of people that it it tends to get lost um the 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 nature of the frankish experience in the levant um is very different than what has been portrayed uh especially recently in in what we might call popular history um it, you know where everything is viewed very um everything's viewed very homogenous you know the the, the Crusaders are always these, you know, uh, white Western Europeans, you know, with with a very foreign culture. Um, the you know the the opposing Muslim forces are are portrayed very similarly to more sort of like the modern perception of Islam. Um, and, and really, the, the 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 truth or the scholarship that, that is starting to to really uh, flourish nowadays is really painting a very, very different picture of Crusader society in, in the Levant and, and, and really how, um, how, how cosmopolitan it was and how um, all, these, all these various ethnic groups that, that came in really, um, really blended with each other a lot more than they, than they contrasted with each other. Absolutely. I think that the first point that you have to really consider and that's something I think that's lost in most popular culture is that the majority of the population of the Levant, and not even talking about Cyprus, but even on the mainland Syria was at least 50%, if not more Christian. Muslims made up a minority of the population without any doubt, because there was also Jews and Samaritans, as well as the Orthodox Christians who still made up the, the majority of the population combined making the Muslims a significant, but nevertheless a minority population. Starting with that, the, the next thing that's really critical is that a lot of the, the historiography, I don't know if it's really the historiography, but the usual portrayal of the Crusaders is as, um, as a bigoted minority, an oppressive uh, elite that is imposing their way upon that, that usually portrayed as, as a Muslim population but even if people accept that there were Christians, they still try to portray the, the Latin rulers oh, Helena, did we lose you? And it, so much so much though so that you question where did this picture come from? Where did this image of the oppressive Latin um, colonial you know, apartheid. Well, oh, there it is again. Pope to Adam, uh, the Bishop Adamar, etc. He talks about the, the well, the Pope, of course, and Urban's himself talks about I, we're we're getting to some of like the best parts of the interview, and of course the uh, our our connection unfortunately uh, wants exactly. to wants to act up. Um, uh, Helena, can you hear us? Well, uh, we'll, we'll we'll wait for uh, for Dr. Schroeder to to reconnect, and, uh, and and hopefully we can finish where she was at. Um, I, I think for our our viewers, what really were Dr. Schrader was getting at was, um, you know, th this idea of this of these monolithic cultures, all uh, you know, contrasting with each other, and and the image of a, a, a you know of a of a minority crusader you know Western elite that was um, you know brutalizing and terrorizing the, the the local populace is really just not supported by the scholarship that is that is now coming out um, and that um, there was a lot of um, very seamless cultural uh, uh, interplay between all these different factions that were present in the Levant um, in, in medieval Levant and uh, it, what, what's important is um, to, to keep in mind is that all these you know the the Frankish the, the Frankish Crusaders did not step into an area that was minority Christian. Uh, most of these areas, as Dr. Schrader uh, very rightly pointed out, is were majority uh, local Christians. Were were Syrian Arab 
Christians. Oh, great. Christ was 95 percent Christian. Oh, good. <laughs> so you're able to join. <laughs> yeah, um, I would also like to point out that, that, that the Christians, went, when the first crusaders, most of them went home, if you can still hear me, they, they left, they think, as little as 300 fighting men behind. I mean, I don't know, Rand, if you have, I don't have that in front of me right now, but I'm, you're, I'm, you're, I'm remembering. You're very close. You're, you're very close. The, the, the number, especially after the Battle of Ascalon yeah. in 1099, yeah. um, the, the numbers of Western crusaders who went back home were well above the 95 percentile. Um, and, and there was a very, very small, um, almost minuscule core uh, that was left behind uh, or that chose and, to stay behind. And yet they expand their territory dramatically over the next 20 years. They keep expanding the, from, from just holding Jerusalem on a tiny insecure route to Jaffa to enti the entire coastline of the event, it, expanding to territory the size of England, stretching from you know the Tur Tur Antia and uh, the coast of of Turkey essentially down to the Red Sea. You don't do that with a very tiny little minuscule part of, of of people. You do that because your native Christians are supporting you. Exactly. Well, and um, I'm I'm actually currently reading uh, a book by um, by Stephen Tibble. Uh, called the Crusader Armies. Um, that, that was kind of one of the books on my list to uh, to read before this interview. And while it it definitely is, you know, obviously as the title uh, implies, is much more on the the military side of um, things. Uh, he brings up a lot of points in that 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 even shocked me. That even I wasn't aware of. Uh, I I guess uh, from the primary source materials that he uh, had available to him. During his research, there are there are documents from the Kingdom of Jerusalem, uh, muster rolls and etc. that list knights uh, in service to the kings of Jerusalem who have both Armenian and Arabic names. Correct. So, Correct. so there were knights of the Kingdom of Jerusalem who were both Armenian and Arab Christians, um, but who fought in the in you know, or or at least possessed the social status of what we would think of as a Western knight. Um, so uh, it, you know, it really was fascinating to see that there was that much uh, cross-cultural interplay going on. Um, but but uh, ultimately, this the thing that that I found even more impressive from Tribble is that he points out. Well, Yuval Harari, of course, has done this tremendous study on the Turkopole, showing that the Turkopoles were also, the term Turkopole does not, is not an ethnic designation whatsoever. It does not refer to Turks. It does not refer to Muslims. It does not refer to crossbreeds or half-breeds or the children of, of mixed marriages. It refers to mounted archers, period. The Franks used the term Turkopole to mean a mounted archer regardless of ethnicity. And he's gone on to prove that on the average, 50% of the cavalry of all crusade, crusader states armed, they're not gonna say crusading armies because I make a distinction, the crusading armies do come from the West, they are Western European, but the, uh, the armies of Jerusalem were made up to 50%, the cavalry of the armies of Jerusalem was 50% Turkopoles. So, and you could, there are some engagements where the Turkopoles were used exclusive, where 80% were Turkopoles, and there are some engagements, particularly, you know, for the heavy charge, where it's the knights who took the lead. But as a rule, the Turkopoles were contributing massively to the success of the armies of Jerusalem. They were providing light cavalry, they were providing cover, they were doing reconnaissance, they were doing skirmishing, they were doing the lightning raids that the Kevil cavalry could not do, it could not do effectively in that environment, and saving the heavy cavalry for what it was good for, which was the mass charge at the right minute. Yes, and that's, um, I, I know uh, Tibble mentions that it, it's kind of the point he hammers home in every part of his book, and and uh, we'll 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 have links to uh, to these various uh, author authors that we discuss in our in our description below. But the, probably the point he hammers home the, the hardest is that the Crusader are you know the the, the forces of the Crusader states um, just by strategic necessity um, had to become very very uh, what, what we would think of in modern terms today as combined arms. Um, they, they had to they had to adapt 
very quickly to a very different uh, military environment than what their original, you know, Frankish lords were, were had been, had been accustomed to, um, and they incorporated all these de- all these other as- all these other elements that were there uh, that had been there for centuries, you know, with the the, the local um, the local communities that, that had existed there, um, and, and they had, and they you're right. I mean, sometimes eighty percent of their armies were uh, composed of of native Christian elements. Um, he also brings up some very interesting uh, ele- uh, some interesting facts on the opposite side, um, especially when he talks about the Fatimid um, Egyptian uh, oh, okay. uh, regime. That they too, um, that mo- many times up to f- up to fifty percent of their armies could be composed of native Christian elements, um, and, and were not, uh, or or even uh, it's even more exotic, like uh, like pagan and Christian. Uh, Ethiopians. I, I, Ethiopians. I was going to uh, say he didn't. It wasn't really that they were Christian. It was that they were not native troops. They're mercenaries. They were dependent on mercenary troops. The Fatimids were dependent on mercenaries, which they could draw, as you say, from from the Sudan, but also from Libya. In other words, the Berbers from the Sudan, from Bedouins, from Armenians as well, who could be Christian. Um, but it wasn't as definitely that they were Christian. It wasn't as though the Coptic Christians were, were being pulled in. They were bringing mercenaries in from other places, some of yes. whom were Christian. And uh, I, I believe there was, uh, because of the, the, the current Fatimid uh, ruling class at the, at the time of the First Crusade, um, I, I think they, they believed that they were ethnically Armenian. Um, uh, due to their due to their names, the the, the uh, yeah, I think I think what's even, what's a bit more important, I would stress, is that everybody looking at the history of the Crusades needs to understand that for the people, the native people of the Levant, or for the native of the Holy Land, let's call it the Holy Land, the conquerors were. That means the Arabs were as alien as the Latin Christians. Yes. The locals of the Levant were not Arabs. They were not. Arab ethnically, it, you know, take away the religious piece. The Arabs were aliens. The Turks were aliens. That means that the first, the, the whole opposite caliphate, it's everything. They were being, they were under an oppressive alien elite. Mm-hmm. Now we can say the same thing was true of the of the Romans. Let's not pretend otherwise. And the same thing was true of the Byzantines. And the, the Byzantine rule in, in the Holy Land in the Levant was extremely oppressive against Samaritans. It was anti-Semitic, and it was also against, um, well, at least hot parts of it were anti-Semitic, and it was also anti-Jacobite, and and, and it, only the Greek Orthodox orthodoxy was, was recognized, and the other forms of orthodoxy were considered heretical. The Byzantines were much more anti the other forms of orthodoxy than the Latins were. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not something you hear very often um, in in uh, popular crusades uh, discussions. It's uh, you know right. too often you get the well. Uh, well it's something that is uh, Thomas Madden also mentions in his book that many of the Oriental Orthodox Christians in the Levant preferred living under Muslim rule, at least for a time, as opposed to the Byzantine rule. That is something to take. take. I urge you to read. The Egyptian work by Bat Yaor before you say that. Because oh, no, I, I'm, reading, I'm a fan. I, I was also skeptical when I read it. Before you but, start yes. reading, you know, and, and the problem I see is that there were certain elites, as she said, there are always those groups that cooperate with the oppressors, the collaborators, and they live very well. And then you can always point to them. And so and so, this Jew actually got very, very high. And so and so, this Christian was able to, you know, oh, she was one of the sultanas and she was very powerful behind the throne. Oh, these wonderful little examples of five t- little people who have, you know, sold out their own people and done very well by themselves. And the fact that the 95% of the population was being oppressed to the point of <laughs> extermination. And the fact that entire villages go to waste because they oppress them to the point where the people run away and they go and hide and they abandon their crops. And the Arabs come in with their herd, herds and destroy the fertility of the land. And entire regions of the Holy Land are, have gone to waste and become desertified after 400 years of nomadic rule that oppresses the peasant class to the point where they're no longer producing food. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, 
I did have another question, though, Dr. Schroeder. Um, when we talk about the Levant being more so, um, say, the Arabs are alien, um, you know, a lot of this gets to, it reminds me somewhat of the, um, the debate over, which I think this is a silly debate, but the, the debate over the race of Jesus. And a lot of people were saying, well, you know, if Jesus were alive today, he would be an Arab or he would be darker. But is it true that most people in Levant back then were actually more Caucasian? Or were more what? Caucasian. I don't know. I'm not. I'm. I. I don't. I honestly don't know. Um, as I say, you can look at the, the natives of the Levant. In fact, I think there's an excellent uh, DNA studies that they're trying to do in Beirut and in Lebanon now to try to to come closer to that. But the initial population. What is the initial? Po where, where do you go back? What's 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 year zero? You know, are we going to go back to Lucy and the Ethiopians coming up into the to the Levant and and all that? There were people who had, you know, had lived in the Levant for generations and generations, and they suffered these waves of um, occupation, whether it's the Romans or the Byzantines or the Arabs or the Turks, the Seljuks or the Latin or the Crusaders or it's the Ottomans. There is a native population there. And most of them, unfortunately, though, when you get you know, the Arab uh invasions they t enslaved people in en masse and would then deport them to other places and bring slaves from somewhere else and import them that there were the idea of deporting slaves and taking them away from their roots was part of their way of of keeping them oppressed keeping them away you know st reducing the risk of revolt etc so there's a conscience policy of taking people away from their roots taking children away from their parents uh the the Arab rule required, you know, a tribute in, in human bodies, in living bodies every year. It wasn't just money that you paid to, the, to, your, to your Arab masters. You had to pay them slaves as well, which meant taking away your children. And taking away children is a way to just take them away and then make them Muslim and make them enemies of them. You make them into Mamluks and they come back and kill their own families. Where is the ethnicity here? Yeah, it's uh, you. You bring up a, a point that's been echoed by um, like our, our our good friend uh, Dr. Andrew Latham, who you know says that you know history that the story of history is the story of human movement, be it forced or be it be it willing or unwilling, um, and and the the idea of you know trying you know, any idea of like ethnic purity or, or anything like that really is. Kind of absurd um, mm -hmm. historically, be, and 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 really just imp impossible historically because it's the the story of human history is the story of human movement, be be it willing or unwilling, um, and, and it's it's the the story of of groups of humans moving all across this planet, um, in, in you know for all sorts of reasons. Um, and getting mixed in with other groups and, and, and so on and so forth for, for generations that they're really, you know, they, to, like you said, you know, where, where is year zero, you know, who, who do we go back to? Um, and, and you could, and you could ask that question of almost every other region in the planet. Um, you know, who, who's the real natives, you know, well, we'll, we'll probably never really know. Um, the, and that's the, why it shouldn't be important. The yeah, bottom line the, is, and that's and that's why I, you know, my love affair, if you like, with with the Crusader states is here. You have these people, and they come in, and what they try to do is make a viable state by allowing the Muslims mm -hmm. to live by Sharia law, by allowing the Jews to have their own love, live by according to their laws. The Samaritans are allowed to live by their law. They're no longer being oppressed by the Jews. No longer being oppressed by the, by the Byzantines. And they have the native Christians and the various Orthodox groups and churches continue with their own priests. And then you get these historians get all wound up about the fact that the patriarch of Antioch was replaced by, well, yes, because very powerful, you know, leading churchmen were political positions. And the perhaps the political power, whether it was Constantinople or Jerusalem, would try to maneuver, you know, and between two kings and a, and a king. I mean, Thomas Becket was murdered for political reasons. Exactly. Not because, you know, By his fellow you know, co-religionists. Yeah. It doesn't have <laughs> anything to do with being opposed to the Byzantines. It has to do with ha wanting to have the person who you control in your positions of power. And the average person living 
continued to live with their priests using the same rites and the language they always used. They created courts that allowed, you know, that said, which I, very, very important. First of all, judgment by one's peers. So that if you're a Samaritan, you're going to be judged by Samaritans. You're not going to be judged by the Latin. That's not true in the under if you're if you're a Jimmy in the uh, Arab courts. No, no, you have to be judged by according to Sharia law. And of course, in Sharia law, if you're not a Muslim, your word word doesn't count. So your all your courts and all your judgment, you have no voice. You are going to be judged by Sharia law. You are not equal. There, there's one other element that I, I, I do want to um, discuss with you um, while we have you, Dr. Schrader. Um, the, and Steve Tibble um, also alludes to this as well. Um, he, he frames the, the conflict in the Holy Land, um, especially yes. dur during the Crusading era. He frames it more, he, he, go, he gets away from talking about and it in strictly. Yeah. Oh, he are you there? About nomads versus versus yes. farmers, and this was just happens yes. to be that all the Christians were were the farmers, and the Arabs tend, or the Muslims tended to be the nomads, and therefore there's a constant. Um, I there's an element of truth to that. I mean, someone I've lived in Nigeria, I've lived in in Ethiopia. They, 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 there is a perennial, you know, millennial certain that level of conflict. I think he overdraws the point. I just think mm -hmm. you can't reduce it to simply. Uh, herders versus um, uh, farmers. When you can, as I say, when you look at, at the, just the law as the, as the Sharia law as it is, and the way people were really treated under the Arabs compared to the way we were treated under the Latins, um, how do you explain that? Because the, the, there's still the, <laughs> there's still herders and and farmers. Yeah, it's, I, I was glad you you were able to you're able to um, to finish that. I, I, we, we maybe um, you're, yeah, your your uh, your your connection may be fading in and out, but I think we got the most the, the majority of it. So um, essentially, for for our listeners who, who didn't understand the background, um, there, there was a there was an argument made in Stephen Tibble's book uh, that he makes quite frequently that um, that the the conflict in in the Levant. Uh, during the crusading era was less about um, religious uh, identities and it was more about sort of the perennial conflict that one sees throughout various historical time periods between uh, nomadic societies, nomadic herd, herd, herding societies, and agrarian city-dwelling societies. Um, and and he, he, he also tries to pull, you know, examples from earlier in history with uh, the Byzantines uh, and with the the Fatimid Egyptians and whatnot, but uh, I, I was glad to hear Dr. Schrader that that you you too felt that that was kind of a reductive uh, conclusion to draw, and that it, it you know it's it, again whenever we discuss anything historical, there's never there's never a one answer fits all. Um, no. You know, we're we're talking about very complex uh, events that have a, a myriad of different. Uh, circumstances all contributing to them um, that that make them what they are. Uh, I, I like I always like to draw the analogy that history is like a mosaic, um, and, and it's it's made up of tiny little bits, you know, of of uh, of colored glass or, or colored stone. That when when you pull back and and you see the thing as a whole, it it creates the picture that we all know. Um, and it's it's kind of absurd to focus down on. You know, just one color. Uh, you know, to say that that's what makes it all. Um, but uh, no, I, if I'm there, I, I don't. As I said, there were too many. As I say, it would be like ignoring the the entire religious fervor of the Crusaders, and that that's very real. And I think the the it's it's people who have no no connection to religious feeling or belief that find it hard to believe. I always have a discussion with, with Western Europeans who tend to be very atheist. And it's just like, oh, they can, it couldn't really have been about religion. It couldn't have been. I mean, how would, why would exactly. anybody go thousands of miles for their faith? I mean, that's madness. No, that, that can't yeah. be true. There has to be, an, it has to have been read. It has to have been something else because they cannot identify with that religious uh, motivation. And so that's that. That may be one of the problems here. I don't. I don't know particularly where where trouble's coming from. But yeah, 
No, it's, that's very well said. Um, there's one one final aspect before we move on with our interview that I wanted to, to discuss with you about, especially because you, you would be able to provide so many examples of this. Um, what what were some of the the long term historical impact of the Frankish presence in the Levant? Um, specifically, what what I always what I, what I tend to see. To see when I, okay, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say typically when I look at it. Um, I kind of see the the Frankish presence in the Levant as sort of the the moment when the West reopened to the world, um, and and it it came back in contact after the after the chaos of the of the fall of the Western Roman Empire um, and whatnot. That that this was really where Western Europe sort of got back in touch with the rest of the world um, was was via its presence in the Levant and. The, the the explosion of trade that that occurred the the cultural interplay that occurred what what would you say to to that um, no absolutely that's absolutely what I was going to say tragically I don't think there was a great deal of impact on the Levant because once they get kicked out and the Mamluks destroy the cities they destroy even the Mamluks are so fanatical which is why I don't think you can just talk this about this as being nomads they even destroy the cities themselves and their own economic base. You had the first half of the 13th century, the Ayyubids working per, from one truce to another and allying themselves with the uh, the, the, the Franks against their, their cousins and their brothers, etc. Because they were all interested in this, keeping this economy going and, and living from the luxury of it. And they, were, they weren't interested in destroying that. The Mamluks are fanatics enough to actually be willing to destroy the economic base of the region. They effectively do that and they turn it back into a backwater for hundreds of years. The Europeans benefit from the from the entire crusading element because because of the Crusader states that presence over two hundred years in the mid, in the Middle East at the crossroads of civilization means that there is increased uh, contact not with just with the Arab world. What's what was more important is with Byzantium, and it's a hugely rich culture with immense libraries and 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 hospitals and all sorts of knowledge. And Antioch is a center for medical um, theorizing and, and, and development, it turns into that. And, and you have a huge impact on medical development, not because the Arabs were more advanced. I mean, Mitchell's proof, it wasn't the Arab medicine wasn't more advanced in, 11, in 1099. But what happens is when you get Byzantine and Latin and Arab medical practitioners coming and talking and, and debating and trying and experimenting and, and exchanging ideas, the whole process of medicine goes into another level. A whole development goes on. And the idea of hospitals spreads back to the West. The idea of leprosarium spread back to the West. And, you know, every other aspect, you know, paper we take that did come from the Arabs, you know, glass making comes from the Arabs. There are a lot of, of the techniques and, and technologies that go back to Europe. But mostly I think, you know, to what you meant, mentioned, Rand, is that you have tens of thousands of pilgrims every single year. Tens of thousands of people going to the Near East, getting out of their little village, crossing the entire Mediterranean, spending normally about six months in the Holy Land, meeting with people, with, with Samaritans and with Jews, and meeting with, with the Orthodox Christians and seeing Arabs, and meeting people from all over the world. And then they return home to their village, they're never the same. Yeah. Well, and, and so even just that pilgrim in, is a multiplier. It's not just the pil it's not just every pilgrim that gets changed. Mm -hmm. It's his family that gets changed. Yeah. Well, and it's and it's uh, you can even just you know even just from a strictly material aspect, you can see the you, you know uh, due to due to Frankish presence in the Levant, um, the, you know the Italian city states are able to send mer merchants. To Accra and and to Antioch and to these other you know huge to Tyre to these huge trade centers um, where they're you know they're beginning to to uh, encounter and and deal in trade goods that are coming as far away as as China um, mm -hmm. it, you know and and that there you know you can find um, you can find Chinese porcelain ware you, you know right. making its way west you can find Western goods making its way all the way east uh, you know there were there were western there were there was a french silversmith at the court of the great khan in in yeah. karakoram um it, you know they, they, i mean and this was in the 1200s um 
you know, so it's, there, there really was this, uh, in fact, I think there's a, there's um, some Italian uh, medieval gravestones in Western China to this, like to this day, there, there are, Marco there, there Polo, are I mean, the classic yeah. case of Marco um, Polo. I mean, there were, there were entire, there were entire Italian trading com colonies that went all the way out into Western China and they all did so through the Levant, um, it, it, you know, and that it, even just, even, so even just from a material, a, a strictly material economic sense, you know, the, the West reopened to that, the world that, again. Yeah. But I, I feel like that's, I, well, I personally think that's a little too narrow because you can talk about exchange of goods and I can buy things from, I don't know, you know, I buy, how many Americans buy Chinese goods today? Sure. We almost all wear nothing but Chinese clothes, right? Do we know anything about China? No. But if you travel to China or if you travel halfway to China and you, over months of time, and every single day and every night you're encountering and talking to people. That's a very different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, why I, I think the importance of the Crusader states needs much more emphasis because the Crusader didn't necessarily have that experience. The Crusader works in a, comes in a large horde of his comrades and they all stay together in their group with their Lord and they stay together talking to each other and they fight their way across, you know, wherever, come and they fight the enemy and then they go back. How impacted are they actually? probably not as unimpacted as I'm making it sound, but the people who came as pilgrims, who came peacefully, who came with their families and stayed for six months, I think were probably much more profoundly influenced by that contact with other peoples. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to our, our next phase of the interview. So r really, you know, why why are there so, and we've already touched on this a little bit but why do so many popular misconceptions exist about this period um it, it, especially in in your in your view okay just a general statement and our friend peter who's studying history any history book you read will tell you or certainly any novel you read will tell you more about the period in which it is written than the period about which it is writing we always write, when we sit down to write, if even, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, I'm stressing the cosmopolitan nature of the Crusader states because that's something which I find important in my own age. It's, it's something I want to talk about because it's relevant in my age. So you have different phases in historiography which reflects what's going on. You have the Reformation, the Pope is banned. The Pope called for the Crusades, and the Pope misused the Crusades for their political purposes, as we. Oh, Helena, do we lose you there for, for for a little bit? Sounds like it on my end. Yeah, we 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 may we may give her a chance to re reconnect. Uh, so essentially. Uh, discredits oh. the, the crusades making sense yeah, yeah i think we lost you there for for a little bit but uh I, I think we caught the gist of it so really to to sum up it's it's the the historiography i'm says sorry more maybe about, I'm... uh the, the historiography says more about the time that we are in and less so about the time that it's that it's you know purported to be talking about and and i think you mentioned already some of the issues with, uh, you know, um, modern attitudes towards religion, specifically medieval Christianity, um, you know, play a, a large role. Um, and really in the West, that's been a problem ever since the Reformation as well, because, um, you know, the, the Crusades have been uh, seen in all eras as, as an unapologetically Catholic Christian uh, operation. And so, you know, obviously, um, post-Reformation, uh, Protestant historians are going to be very hostile to it um, for for obvious reasons, and then uh, and then with the rise of modernity, with secular modernity, um, yeah. which also does not have a very good attitude towards um, you know traditional or authentic Christianity. Um, it, it, so you know, there's. I'm back. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, so it's um, and uh, you know I think it's interesting also when I um, I actually uh, had the privilege of going to to Jerusalem uh, here about uh, about four years ago, and um, while I was there I, I stayed at uh, what 
what's called the Austrian hospice in the old city. Um, and it, I think it's down, I think it's right down from the Damascus gate. I think um, uh, it's either the Damascus gate or the lion gate. I can't remember which one, but um, uh, the, the hospice was built in the mid 19th century uh, uh, and it was funded by um, the, the Habsburg uh, Austro-Hungarian em emperor, Karl Franz, uh, or not Karl, yeah, Karl Franz, uh, the first one, the elder one, um, not, not, the, not the World War I uh, Emperor Karl, but uh, the, his father, I think. Um, and uh, so uh, one thing that struck me was um, I think we lost Helena Ram. Uh oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see if she can come back, uh, and, and we'll add her back in. But just for our, our viewers um, to to finish this story, um, something that was very interesting in the Austrian hospice was uh, the chapel, and in the chapel was this mural uh, painted, obviously commissioned by uh, the, the the Habsburg. Um, Austro-Hungarian emperor, and it was, you know, it shows him and he's wearing, uh, you know, it's got him portrayed, you know, in a very sort of stereotypical 19th century, you know, nationalist uh, pose. And he has his, uh, you know, he's wearing the, one of the cloaks of the, uh, of, of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre um, and surrounding him are all the representatives of the German crusading orders, None, no one else. Um, no, no Templars, no Hospitallers. <laughs> it's only the, only the Teutonic Knights. Um, and, uh, you know, they're all, uh, you know, they're all kind of around him in these very heroic poses. And it, it's very 19th century romanticist, uh, it, you know, imagery. And uh, um, Dr. Helena, do, do, do we have you back? Can you hear us? We'll, we'll see if we can get our connection back up. Um, but yeah, so it was just a very interesting uh, portrayal. And it, it reminded me a lot of the attitude that was very prevalent in the 19th century where, it, you know, everything was very romanticized. Everything was very nationalistic. Um, you had this uh, um, very modern um veneer put on a, a very medieval topic. And um, so it, it reminded me that, um, you know, the, the, the issues that we face his, in terms of the history, in, in terms of the historiography of the Crusades has to do a lot with that, like has to do a lot with, you know, what were the, what were the people who at the time, what was their attitude towards that? How did they see it? And, and we're still seeing that today in, in the 20th and 21st centuries with, um, you know, everything trying to be uh, refashioned into some sort of uh, socioeconomic commentary, you know, that has to do with Marxism or, or, or you know, class struggle or, uh, you know, something along those lines. Um, you know, it's, it, everything is being refashioned into what's popular in academia today. Um, obviously, you know, in, in our own time, we're seeing more sort of like the cultural aspect of, you know, everything has a racial angle to it, or everything has a, has an ethnic angle, angle, or, you know, something along those lines where it's like, it has to somehow be devolved or boiled down into some sort of commentary on racial politics, you, you know, and, 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 and unfortunately when you do that, um, and this is something Peter that, you know, I'm sure you see as well, um, when, when you boil history down to something so simplistic, um, and so, uh, reductive that you lose so much of the, the actual, um, the actual his history, the, the, you know, the real, not to, not to take off not to play off our, our name, but the real history, um, uh, of it. So, um, yeah, so basically, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's basically, you know, what we see very often in modern history is um, an attempt to impose very modern narratives and uh, and uh, modes of thinking upon uh, groups of people in a time period that would have uh, that would have been very alien to think that way. Uh, instead of 
getting at uh, what these people would truly have thought, what they truly would have felt at the time. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Helena. Do we have you back? Yeah. Oh, there she is. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm not Uh, yeah, we were just kind of talking a, a little bit in your absence about the, uh, you know, some of the, the, the historical revisionism that, that you see um, kind of, you know, especially especially in the 19th and up through the 20th and 21st centuries when, when it comes to this topic. Oh, good Lord. This is probably not going to work. I think there's tech the technology is getting in the way, but I was going to say clearly, you know, the of uh, the Crusader states. Are you still there, Dr. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll 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 continue as best we can. Uh, yeah. I think um, really the 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 last thing that we really had to discuss with you uh, while we still have you is. Um, from your perspective, and I know you've listed some already. What are some of what are some good resources for those who are interested in studying, uh, especially about the Crusader presence and the Frankish presence in the Levant? What are some good resources that are available out there for everybody? Do we still have you, Dr. Schrader? Just now, but I missed your question. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, real, real quick, what are, what are some good resources for, for those of our uh, listeners who are interested in studying this, studying more of this topic? What are some good resources for them? There. The reason I'm writing this book is because there isn't a good resource that I, you really have to, that there's no really good kinds of study. I, I apologize to our viewers. It, it, it looks like, uh, it looks like a poor I, connectivity. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm getting, I'm getting yeah, messages I, I, that, that, you, that you probably can't. I, I think we caught a little bit of it, and that was uh, that you are writing your own book as as we speak. Hey, can you hear me? No. I I could. We we just heard you just now. Okay, so I was. I think you heard me say that um, there's not a really good comprehensive book. Some of the older books are some of the best. Um, Jonathan Riley Smith's The Feudal Nobility in the Kingdom of Jerusalem is a brilliant book show, talking about the, the 13th century and, and the sophistication of the society. Um, Feudal Monarchy in the Kingdom of Jerusalem by John Lamont is an old book, but it describes the institutions extremely well. Um, you know, as you say, what you were just mentioning, Tribble's book about the armies is very enlightening. Uh, McKevitt's book about rough tolerance was, of course, one of the pivotal pivotal works, and probably the most important recent scholarship that has literally changed. It's been it's we create, created an entirely new, you know, image of the Crusader states. Is of course, um, uh, uh, what do I say? There we are. Ronnie Ellen Bloom. It's Ronnie Ellen Bloom's Frankish settlement in the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem with a black and white cover. You couldn't have made it look more boring if you had tried. I mean, it's just a horrible, <laughs> it's a horrible looking book by Cambridge University Press. And it's revolutionized our understanding of the Crusader states because this archaeology went, archaeologists went out and surveyed 200 Frankish villages. And all of a sudden, their Frankish villages out in rural areas with no walls around them. And you have that all of a sudden the entire 20th century view of the Crusaders being urban dwellers living in cities, afraid of going out among their own people and, and little, you know, living like like in apartheid and little 
conclaves is wrong. He's proved it with stone. The Franks were not living in the cities. Half of them were out in the villages and they were that's, living among the native Christians. That's absolutely fascinating. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure and put links to a lot of these books that, uh, that she's mentioning uh, here for, for our viewers. We'll make sure and put those uh, in the description. Um, for everyone. Um, Dr. Schrader, I, I hopefully we, we get you on for just a few more minutes. Um, if, if any of our viewers uh, currently watching now have any questions, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and open it up for, for questions now. Um, but uh, I think uh, we, our, our time might be, our time with Dr. Schrader unfortunately might be limited. Before we do start our questions, I do want to let everyone know that this is simply part one of our interview uh, with uh, Dr. Schrader. We will be doing another one, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully if, 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 uh, if everything works out and uh, in, in, in our uh, technology doesn't uh, 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 collapse on us, we'll, um, we, we'll be doing this Sunday, uh, November 29th uh, at the same time at 12 noon. Um, and uh, that will, in our part two, we'll be discussing um, Dr. Schrader's, uh, um, her, her fictional work with, uh, with her historical fiction series that is based in uh, Frankish Levant um, that, that she has become very well known for. I, you, you may not be a best-selling author, but I know I've seen you, you, you've won multiple awards for it. So um, I, 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 yes, I, I yes. hope you don't, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't, don't short sell yourself there. Um, uh, but uh, cause I, I know I've, I've, I've been, I've watched, you know, I've been an audience to you winning awards for your, uh, for your books. So they, they are out there and they are very, very popular. Um, so um, that will be our part two. So please set your calendars for Sunday, the 29th um, at, at 12 noon U S central standard time. Um, and, and hopefully, hopefully we don't, uh, hopefully the technology gods uh, smile on us um, as, as we, uh, uh, as we plan for that. But uh, if any of our viewers have any questions for, for Dr. Schrader, please, uh, please, please put them in the chat. Um, but uh, we've got one question so far from Tom Griffin. He says, crusade is more of a modern term and thus we refer to each expedition as the first, second, etc. But in the time period, the crusades were actually taking place. How did medieval Christians refer to them? That's that's one of the, very good question because it's often done, this is an anachronistic term. The terms that were used at the time were things like those who wore the cross or cross bearers or people. Who, and it's like it's all the words for crusader that's just a little bit more complex. So I actually have no problem with using the term crusader um, for those who took a vow to come to the east which doesn't mean that they were necessarily part of an organized campaign, but it does distinguish them from the Franks who were living and grew up in Outremer and obviously were not crusaders. They didn't take a crusading vow. They were simply there defending the heritage of Christianity. They saw themselves as being the guardians of the, of, of, for all of Christendom, and, but they were not crusaders. They didn't take a crusader vow. Was the term okay. crucignati used at the, at oh, yeah. the time? Yeah, you, know, you, you, you'll see there's a variety of different terms depending on whether you're using Latin or French or whatever dialect. Um, wow, all right, very cool. Um, this one isn't so much of a question, it's more of a comment, but I thought it was interesting. Um, not sure how it relates, but <laughs> uh, William of this is from Dorothy Gaffney. Uh, William of Tyre's poor intelligence in 1179 led to the fall of. If I'm pronouncing this correctly. Chasselet. He was in Rome that year for the third Lateran. What do you two make of that? That's a it, it, unfortunately without um, without some other context. I'm, uh, I I really am not sure. Where it's going, and I know um, William of Tyre and, and Dr. and Dr. Schrader, you can you can comment on this as well. Um, William of Tyre can be a he can be kind of a problematic source um, for information in the Crusader Kingdom because he was he was very very partisan, um, and he, he was definitely yeah he was and he was not afraid to let that partisanship show um, in, in his writings, and so. Um, there, there can be a lot of if you're if you're not sure how, if, if you're not familiar with the 
the historiography behind him, um, you can get a very skewed view of, of crusader state politics um, in, in the late 12th century. Um, Interesting that you say. I actually find Tyre one of the more neutral commentators and certainly less biased than, than things like the itinerarium, et cetera. So interesting that you say that, but no historian is without a bias. Yes, and, and well, and absolutely. When, and people like the, you know, people like the itinerarium, I mean, they were writing specifically Propaganda. to record the exploits of their patron, um, you know, who in, in the itinerarium's case was was uh, Richard I. So, um, you know, and, and you really find that with most medieval chroniclers. I think it's it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to find a medieval chronicler who is uh, which, strict, which is, yeah, but strictly it's neutral. No, no. Yeah, but you, it, I, don't, I don't think you can find any. But I think Tyre is actually one of the few historians, and why he's so highly respected among historians is because he's very careful to say, "I have heard this from people who were there," or he'll say. I have heard rumors, or he will say, I've heard different opinions. Some say this and some say that. He does an awfully good job of being, uh, of, of saying, I saw this personally, this I have secondhand, this has been contradicted. That you don't find in most chronicles. I think William of Tyre is actually one of the most, one of the best chronicles that we have of the, from the period. I know a lot of uh, a lot of scholars who who specialize in like the Templar uh, in like the history of the Templar order uh, oh. typically have issues <laughs> yeah, with them. Like yeah, he <laughs> William of Tyre did not like the not Templars. Not like the Templars. Um, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah. um, but okay, uh, I think we go. That's fair. But on the whole, he's very very good, and he'll say things like some people said this and other people said that, and I don't know what to believe. Okay. And and so be careful. Yeah. Depending on what the topic is, he can be quite a quite a good source. He's always a good source because he's contemporary. Uh, it looks like we've got one last question, uh, and it's from Mark. And he says, "Hello, Dr. Schrader. I really love Night of Jerusalem. Uh, he's Thanks. ordered the sequel right away. Um, will there be a new edition for those coming as well?" Not to that extent. Um, Ed Voy of Jerusalem. What happened is when I did the rewrite of Night of Jerusalem because of research and things like the new evidence about the Battle of Mount Gassard, which really totally, I have to put this out there, totally just shreds the idea that Raynaud de Chatignon was in command in any way, shape, or form. Raynaud de Chatignon was not in command at Mont Gassard. The, the, the terms of, it's, and that's in William of Tyre, the terms on one which William um, Chatignon was made commander was only if the king was absent. Baldwin IV was at the field at Mont Gassard. He was in command of his troops. He was, Grenoel de Chatillon was not the leader. Things like that made me, I had to rewrite Night of Jerusalem. There was no compelling reason to make, make major changes in the later two books. But I had, when I readjusted that, I made it, I made the first book more authentic in that I made the brother, the, the fake brother Henri, I made him a cousin. Henri de, uh, and that's closer there. There is a half brother, there is this character. And so the second two don't quite mesh with the new Night of Jerusalem, if this is making sense to you. I've rewritten Envy of Jerusalem, so it now meshes with Night of Jerusalem. And that has just went, that has gone live today on Atasca, the new version. It's really, and, and I should, we can try to make that, maybe make that link available as well. It'll be up on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles within two to three weeks. Oh, but Defender, I have not managed to do those minor adjustments yet. The basic storyline is the same, but there are some things that don't quite match and have to be brought up to date. And I will be doing that in the next six months. Okay. Perfect. Well, and that, uh, that I think that's a nice segue into uh, our hopeful part two um, interview that we do with you. Where we will um, we will be going into uh, in depth in kind of the not only the the, the work you've done with his, with your historical fiction series, but we'll also be going into uh, kind of like the history behind it. Um, yeah. and, and, and why? So, but why novels are important? Because I think that's um, when you got right down to it. A lot more people read novels than read history. <laughs> That is, that is very true. Sort of freak, we're, we may be sort of the freaky, the geeky people here who really like history books and say, oh, it's, have you read William of Tyre? And, you know, exactly. and get into right. that. But the average person is more likely to read a novel than a history book. 
Okay. And therefore, I think it's really important to try to make this history accessible and make people who might otherwise not pick up a history book read about this era and maybe learn something about it. Um, I think we're gonna. Uh, I, I think we're probably good to end it on that note. Peter, uh, are, are you seeing anything uh, on, on your end? Um, yeah, there was another question. Um, it's it's not related to the Crusader States and Levant, but I mean, I don't know. Should we save that for next time or? Yeah, yeah, we should probably. Uh, I think I see that it's that question from Michelle Arens about uh, Islamic Spain. Um, that that probably be we'll, we'll probably save that for for later um, since since we're, we're we're kind of short on time with uh, with, with Dr. Schrader's connection. So yeah, Michelle, um, uh, tune in for the next one and write that same question again. Absolutely, yeah, and and we'll make sure we'll we'll make sure we'll ask that uh, before we get started. So, um, Dr. Schrader, thank you so much for You're for joining welcome. us. Uh, thank thanks for having the patience with uh, with all the technical difficulties. No. I want to thank um, our, our, our viewers or hearers or whatever we call listeners for putting up with this bad technology. <laughs> <laughs> they are the true heroes. Exactly. Sure. Um, and and uh, good luck. Uh, good, good luck to your endeavors. And we will Thanks. see you again, uh, hopefully on the 29th. So uh, this, this is us signing out. So Dr. Schrader, again, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you much, all. Dr. Schrader. All, all right. right. And, and uh, thank you to all our viewers. And uh, we, we will see you all again here soon.